the study of analogy. And uh, a good part of my <clears throat> reflections, in one way or the other, deals with this central issue. And if we can understand analogy, you have an easy access into the whole classical world. Now, <clears throat> let's see if I can bring you into it. There are only three things you can really study. You neither study things, anything at all, or you can study the relation between things. And you can also study relationships between the things in relationships. Most of our culture deals with number one. What's a thing? Break it apart. See how it fits together. In other words, we seek the relationships of parts, parts to whole, is most of our energy. How to understand a car? How to understand an atomic bomb? How to understand anything? Break it apart, see how the parts fit together. This is more curious. Right now, we, our culture is spending an interesting part of their energy in trying to understand this, especially when it's two different people. Right. Study of relations. That involves this, the higher level, which is the way in which relations relate, or the study of relationships between things in relationships. And I want to explore that for a moment. Now, <laughs> this brings me into the most interesting, I think, and curious of all questions. You can take it theologically for the moment, just to see the point. What was the, what was the first thought in the mind of God such that it brought about the necessity for creation? What was that first? When? What was it? It's a profound mystery. The first distinction, like the first distinction, because everything followed after that. See, the first distinction is also necessarily a separation. To make the distinction of the separation must be on the basis of difference, because if you only have sameness, there's no distinction. Yet, there has to be something about the, in this and the, the arena uh, that's same. The distinction itself is singular, bam, like a bolt from the, from the Zeus, the mind of God, the Zeus. Uh, what's interesting is that, uh, go into mythology for a moment, you see Athena burst forth from the forehead of Zeus, totally clad and ready for action. It's a distinction, right out of the mind of God. Now look what it is. Before the distinction, you can't say anything. It's the unutterable. So you have the unutterable. You have the ineffable, the pure one with no distinctions. Once you have a distinction, then you've entered into a different world. I mean, you've, or you could say you enter into the world. Because in making the distinction, you're limiting. You're limiting. So necessary to distinction is creating a limit out of the unlimited. Therefore, the most primary, the most primary distinction must be limit 
involve limiting ing and unlimiting, the unlimited. Once that occurs, now you can count. You can say one, one, one and one, two, the distinction, three, uh, the relationship between A and the distinction, the relationship to B and the distinction. You can talk about the relationship between these two. You can make great number of distinctions now are possible once the first is made. And it presupposes, therefore, that out of the unutterable, a distinction was made, a separation, and it must be on the basis that there was a need, a basis for making the distinction. Therefore, every distinction, there must be a difference in value. Don't make a distinction in something that's totally the same. Therefore, it presupposes a value. If it presupposes a value, then one must be higher or greater than the other. Necessarily. Yet, each must be a unity. It's limited, so each must be a unity. And so in that way, we can say, Limit and the unlimited are both unities. They are what must be in place in order to make the distinction. There must be the unlimited and then suddenly the limiting. Then there must be, once the distinction is made, one, 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 one and many, because one and many is in that arithmetic world of numbering. Now we can say there's the same and difference. I can compare. A and B, there's something similar between these two. Ah, other must be two things, and there must be a difference between them. Now I can use the word other. Therefore, the primary term is limited, unlimited, out of the unutterable. Now, in terms of reflection, when the primary limit and unlimited mix, and that's what the distinction is, that's what the Greeks call, Plato calls, being. That's what being is with a capital B. Put it another way, all right? Take the unutterable. The first distinction must be a vast unlimitedness, power unspeakable, limit, being able to find a way of dividing. Right? What is it that's being divided? There must be something, there must be something you're dividing. Being, first idea comes into existence as being. Now, in any mixture of the limited and the unlimited, however that came to be, there are three pr interesting properties that follow from it. We can talk about symmetry, truth, and beauty. Because any mixture is only a good mixture to the degree for there to be a, see, there must be a reason for this coming into existence. What comes into existence must be a union of these two. But the union of two things brought together in that union, that's really the concept of symmetry. That's the basis of symmetry. Now, when two things can be brought into union in creating this, something comes into being. Right? That thing that comes into being, each of which is pure, becomes one. This becomes one. Becomes a one. In which you can say there are these two aspects of it. There are these two aspects of it from its origin. Now, necessarily there must be beauty because whenever reason enters into form, Whenever reason appears, the preeminence of reason and form brings about the presence of beauty. That is beauty. That's the way beauty functions, right? Creatively bringing about that kind of fundamental change right? as reason pervades it. My good heavens, you know what that means? That's the preeminence of beauty. It comes through necessarily. Therefore, being must be these three things. You can talk about it in terms of a natural symmetry, 
a truth because it brings, brings into being or into existence something. Now let's take a look at this curious thing. Suppose I take for an example, um, I want to use these four terms, and to you it, do it, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back and do it in a different way. All right? We're saying that, let's take the idea of God, right? and there's an idea in the mind of God, and on that basis of that idea, he then generates and creates the universe. or the cosmos. Now, if he creates the universe in this way, then this idea must be the controlling idea that's used to bring about this creation. So we can say God uh, is to the universe very much like the artist, right? like the artist, right? might focus his mind on an object, dwells upon it, and with the skill he possesses, brings about a likeness of that model into his copy, which is his production. So in that way, the very possibility of creation presupposes likeness. If there weren't the condition of likeness, there could be no creation either here or here. Therefore, for the most fundamental idea to talk about is the idea of likeness. Now, let's take a look. We can now say um, the art, the artist, right? the artist's model is to his or her copy as God is to the universe. Now, when I do that, See, when I'm doing that, I have four terms, A, B, C, D. If I can say, a model is to a copy as, that's as, four dots, right? As God is to the universe. Well, the very condition, the very condition for creation, we said, was likeness. Well then, the degree to which these two things are like, to that very degree, we can talk about an integrity to the model to the copy. To that degree, we can say that there is a development into a purity. We can say it reaches an ideal to the degree that the model and the copy have some integrity that's the idea of greatness. Because the preeminence of something in a class, that's greatness. Now, if there's a preeminence in the class, right, then you have something interesting. Remember when we talked about beauty? We said beauty, beauty has another aspect to it. What does it do? It's a symmetry in which the rational predominates and allows the form, therefore, to participate in the patterns and order and symmetry and balance. Therefore, if the artist is going to relate to his copy in the way in which the model contains those original ideas, then necessarily the universe is going to be beautiful. Therefore, necessarily in the idea of creation, there must be likeness, greatness, and beauty. That's impossible unless each of the things that are brought together are chosen with care, each of the colors, each of the arrangements, such that all of those parts can function together in a unitary way. That, by the way, is the classic idea of justice. Huh. Well, then, look here. Suppose I were then to take this analogy I have here, model is to copy as God is to the universe, and let me then Talk about another one, all right? And then let's go back to the theological one later. 
let's take the one that's in Plato, that governs Plato. We can say everything we've just said about it. We can say, as a shepherd is to his sheep, so the ruler is to his subjects. Four terms. That's a four-term analogy, therefore. And we can say, as a shepherd functions as a ruler, to that degree he is like a ruler. Well, sheep can be said to be like subjects, and subjects can be said to be like sheep. Rulers can be like a shepherd to their subjects. And therefore, these are the four possible similes you can make based upon likeness. A shepherd is like a ruler, a ruler is like a shepherd. Uh, subjects are like sheep, sheep are like subjects. Therefore, the idea of likeness is the condition where you're moving from, these are called ratios, things that are being related to in some meaningful way. When you make comparisons in the same order, between ratios, that's a likeness. So, look here. Then any two, th no, what's interesting is that no matter how many things there are in the universe, you can always find a way in which you can relate one thing with another, always. Therefore, the entire universe is interrelated. When you find ways in which you can relate things in classes that are similar, that are similar, you can then create systems and structures of analogy. See, shepherd and sheep, husbandry, right? That's husbandry. The way in which man has learned to rule and provide for domesticated animals. A ruler, right? Governing, that art by which rulers therefore develop skills in governing their subjects to bring about a more just society. Both of these structures, therefore, are governing. Right? This is the class of governing. This deals with domesticated animals. This regards in the world of mankind. So these are the ways in which man can govern. One idea to govern, two ways of expressing it. Now we can find likenesses, since we can always find likenesses between similar sets. Now look, this is something curious. What is an analogy, right? Let's take a look at it. There are three kinds of terms you can use in an analogy. Right? You can put in them symbols. You can put in them numbers. You can put in ideas. So you can say, a is to B, as B is to C. You can put numbers, 2 is to 4, as 4 is to 8. Right? We can put in here uh, uh, Socrates, uh, Agathon, a student of Socrates, is to Socrates, as Socrates is to Diotima, his teacher. Socrates' his teacher, as you know, is a woman, Diotima at least reported to be. So we can substitute in any analogy symbols, numbers, ideas. When we use numbers or lines, they belong in the same class. They're all the same, because they're all ones. All right, they're all ones. Therefore, we call that a homogeneous class. Homogeneous class all the same. The beauty, though, therefore, of using ideas is that, therefore, you substitute ideas for numbers, and then these are different, totally different and homogeneous. They belong in the same class called mankind, but they are not qualitatively, pardon me, quantitatively the same. Therefore, these are called heterogeneous. But whether it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, they obey the same rules, the same rules. Therefore, all the mathematics is just a subclass of analogy. Now, you can have, you can have 
two terminologies, you can have three terminologies, you can have four terminologies, and beyond that, as many as you want. <clears throat> now, let's go back to theology. Let's go back to theology for a moment and see what we can do. Right? We can say, God is to the universe. Right? Unlimited. Unlimited indeed, right? Limited. Ineffable. Right? Describable. Unspeakable power limit. Very curious. In other words, you might ask whether or not in this, two is to four, as four is to eight, there is something behind all of that. We can say they're reducible, can't we? We can say they're reducible because they're multiples of two. We can say one is to two is two is to four. All right. And that means there's some common measure through the whole thing. There's some common measure through the whole thing. But what common measure will we find between God and the created universe? What kind of relationship can we find between the created and the created? Because they're totally without common measure. No common measure. In that sense, one is incommensurable with the other. There's no common way in which you can find a common measure between the two. Oh, by the way, if you take a line segment and cut it in a greater and a lesser and use that same ratio when you want to cut this line so that you're cutting this line into a greater and a lesser and use that same ratio on the lesser side so that you cut it into a greater and a lesser right? just to make it right? if you do that and if it comes out that way you will have created a rather curious cut this is called a cut because if you make it into the greater and the lesser such that the same ratio can be applied to the greater as you do to the lesser, this is called the golden section. This is called the golden section, one of the most fascinating of all possible ratios. It's the fundamental aesthetic principle found in mathematics and nature. Um, we can do something. We can show this in another way because what we want to see is whether or not these two measures are the same. Well, that's what we're going to do. Okay, look here. Suppose we just have some fun for a moment. And we say, let's just get a line and on the line create a box, A, B, a square, and make a square. And then make a diagonal of the square, semi-diagonal of the square when we cut A, B, so then we have C, D, and cut it here such that this is half. This is half of the former line AB. Now, if we make that into a radius and sweep out an arc, right, and then swing it all the way around, right, then this distance is to this distance. Let's call this little a and this b. If we could say little a is to little b as that little b is to the entire length, um, which the entire length would be uh, fe, I wonder what Fe would be like if we could just pull it out of there. Well, you know what we can do? We can extend this. That would be like another square just like that. 
and then we could extend the line, which is a diagonal, to half a diagonal would be a full diagonal. If we call this one, this side one, since it's a square, then one and one is still two, We're using the Pythagorean uh, theorem, right, taking this triangle, this triangle, therefore two square plus one square equals c square, right, and that should be five equals c square, therefore that whole line is uh, five square, square root of five. And this is only half, right? We only said this is half, so let's just take this. So this line, CE, would then be five square root of five over two, right? Half of it, and this would be the other half, so the whole thing would be square root of five. Hey, if that's the case, if we had a, someone who likes numbers, if you work that out, that's 1.1 1 .1 something or other, right? Because that comes about 2.2 something or other, you divide it by two and that's 1, 1. So then this whole thing, this whole thing is the radius and that's equal to 1, 1. I wonder what, right, then this is half. Half of that would be 1.6. It turns out to be 1, 1, 6, 0, 8, et cetera. So what? I mean, what do we do all this for? Oh, oh, look here, I know what. This whole line is one, and this area, right, is going to be, if we subtract this, is going to be 608. Hey, do you know what that means? Little a is to b then, as little b is to a plus b, because this is b and so is this b, isn't it? So it's a plus b. Hey, you know what that means? We have a two terminology, a's and b's. And what does that tell us? That tells us that there's an incommensurability between our original terms, God and the universe, and we can represent that in our model. And if I can say there is something incommensurable between God and the universe as there is between the artist and his production, there's something amazing about the model and its relationship to its copy. No matter how clever or good you are in respect to creating a copy, it's never going to be the model. There's something basically and fundamentally incommensurable between the two of them, so fundamentally different. So, but look here. If we, take, if we take for a moment a three terminology, right? We need some rule for transforming analogies. And we have a simple one, rules for transforming an analogy. This, this is called a ratio, that's called the ratio. To switch the terms in the same order, you have the same thing. In other words, we can say A equals two, B equals four, C equals eight, and it'll work out, right? Four is to two is eight is to four. We can also shift the terms between the ratios. So we can also say between the ratios, taking them in the same order, we can say B is to C as A is to B. And then we can switch them around just as we did before. Wait, what did I just do? Um, B is to C as A is to B, B is to A. Right, there you are. Okay. You notice something curious about this? It has a symmetry. We could just fold it over, couldn't we? We could superimpose it. That's a symmetry. It's a double symmetry. It's a double symmetry. We could equally fold it over this way. Oh, <laughs> notice B. Yeah. Oh, the ratio A is to B and its converse B is to A moves from the first position to the second position here. 
And uh, <laughs> the same thing happens over here, doesn't it? This moves over here, right? So that it switches. The second goes to the first, first goes to the second. So therefore it has a balance. And it has a pattern. And it has a symmetry. Right? Hmm. Oh, I wonder whether it also has an interesting order. Look here. Um, is it possible B, A, C, B, B, A, C, B? Ha, <laughs> ha. Ah. I wonder whether you can do the same thing this way. B, A, C, B, A, C, B, B, A, C, B. Huh. Hey, you know these extreme terms? I think, right? A and C, they move from the extremes to the mean position, don't they? Right in the middle. They go from the outside to the inside terms. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of order then, isn't there? Right? So therefore, if you're structuring something with three terms, and you understand this, then this structure already has built within it aesthetic principles. It already is aesthetic. So if you're doing something that requires you to play with threes, and it can be arranged in this way, you know how to arrange it to extend and to make explicit all the possible aesthetic dimensions in that curious analogy. So in that analogy, when you have balanced patterns, symmetry, and order, <laughs> obviously you have beauty because that's one way of defining beauty. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, in other words, we can put into this three terms. Let's put three terms in just to have some fun. As we did before, let's do it here. So three terms. Teacher. Student. Diotima, Socrates. Socrates became a teacher of Agathon. Therefore, if you want to make these comparisons, you can compare Socrates as the teacher of Diotima. You can study how Socrates was a student in comparison with Agathon as a student. You can see how Diotima related to Socrates and Socrates Diotima, how Socrates relates to Agathon and Agathon relates to Socrates. You can see the process that it took. Socrates to go from here to here. Now that's a very interesting way of playing. Oh, therefore we can put in here Diotemus to Socrates, and Socrates is to Agathon, and all of these relationships fit. Therefore, since this is in the dialogue Plato's Symposium, we can go back into it and see whether we can identify each one of these relationships. If so, he's doing it self-consciously. And if he's doing that, therefore he has a structure within which to cast his terms, which already has aesthetic beauty. So therefore, to the degree to which he can hold them together and present them with a certain artistry, they already have, and they're already moving into an arena of beauty. Yeah. Now, if you take these four terms, pardon me, three terms. We can make a story of it. And we could say, hey, you know what? Knowledge is to uh, understanding. Huh? Is, see, um, is to ignorance. We can put those in there. Knowledge is understanding. His understanding is to ignorance because he was ignorant. No, we can break that up into two pieces. Let's do that. Let's make this, therefore, into a four terminology. Knowledge is to understanding as opinion. Right opinion is to ignorance. Now we have four terms. Now if we have four terms, no, we can do, we can change this. We can change this. And if we change this with four terms, 
using those two principles, we can say A is to B is C is to D, and see what we transform the terms by reversing them, right? Taking, taking the terms alternately, conversely, taking the terms conversely, taking the, switching the terms, right? Doing the same thing with CD, C is to D, as A is to B, D is to C, as B is to A. These are our eight possible transformations of a Ford terminology, so that if we put these terms in here, let A equal knowledge, let B equal understanding, let C be opinion, and D, D equals ignorance, then these are the possible valid ways in which they can be related. Now, we might say, I'd rather see someone play that role. All right, then this will be diatema. All right, this will be diatema. This will be Socrates. All right. This, he had to be brought along. Socrates had to be brought along because at one time he was ignorant as described in the text. And then he reaches the right opinions of things. So we can say Socrates goes through these four stages. If that's true then, I bet we can then go into the dialogue and represent each one of these stages as he progressively goes through them. So therefore we can just put them into a four-part structure, right? Knowledge, right? Uh, pardon me. Ignorance, opinion, understanding, knowledge. We can put it this way, progressive. And if we do that, if we could create a story describing all the difficulties Socrates has in going up this, all the difficulties in going from ignorance to through all the difficulties to getting the right opinion about things and then finding understanding and finally knowledge, if we could represent that in a story, create a story where we could then present these ideas, then this, this level, this level we could have darker than this, close to the light, more true. Oh, then we could put this in uh, a cave, and then we could put this in, uh, <coughs> consider this the upper world, two parts of the upper world. Then if we could represent all the forces of ignorance in our story and how to get the right opinion about them, put that in a story, we'd have the allegory of the philosopher king as he struggles through these cognitive states to reach his goal. Well, if you can do that, <clears throat> then for every difficulty, then for every difficulty you have, we can then represent it in our story. Then we'll have a story to which every event in the story corresponds to something going on in the cognitive domain as a person moves from ignorance to right opinion to understanding to knowledge. That's an allegory. That's an allegory. That's what an allegory is. Systematic way of representing complex ideas with artistry, with precision, with sufficient clarity so you can make clear all the transitions from step to step, through stages to stages, into the cognitive realm until a man is finally free, reaching the highest state, which is a perception of the nature of reality. Now, <clears throat> we could shift it we could shift it and create a parallel, a parable. The only thing you need with a parable is that you keep hidden, keep hidden from the many, keep hidden from the many, the nature of the key terms in your story so that only the inner circle gets it, and that's a parable. In the Gospel of Mark, as you undoubtedly are familiar, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to teach everybody nothing but parables, but for you, the inner circle, I will translate each of the images. And he then advances this wonderful statement where he says, I, I only teach in parables so that the many, lest they, turn and, lest they turn and repent. He doesn't want them to repent. He wants to keep it from them. The Platonic tradition is no parables, 
All the terms must be clear, all the terms must be unpacked, all the terms must be revealed. When that happens, it becomes an allegory. For the people who understand the parable, of course, then becomes an analogy for them. Now, look here. We can now go back, well armed, And what we're doing is nothing other than talking about this third category of studying relationships. Because in an analogy, this is the known, familiar, familiar. This is the known, always, the first two terms. This is the unfamiliar or the unknown. And so the very process of analogy is to try to discover in what is known all the key elements you need so that you can transfer them to the unknown and therefore making the unknown more accessible. That's the goal. So in philosophy, especially in the game that we're involved in, we take a look at one's present condition and the difficulties. Then you want to then discover some its roots, which is in the unknown. All right. So you explore the unknown in terms of the known. You open it up so that you can then bring it back and see it fresh and clear. See that? Let's do it again. A right? person has a difficulty. A person has a difficulty. Can't figure out something. Say, so, okay, let's get all the terms, let's get all the ideas. Oh, what is this like? Similar. Oh. It's like something I don't know, something in my past. Oh, something that I haven't fully understood, digested. Oh, what's that? We get a sets of terms. There's a similarity between these terms and these, even though there's a difference. When we weigh the significance of the language in both, just like we're doing with analogies, then we can see between the two a commonness that runs through the whole thing. We discover they are similar. We discover they are similar. Well, wait a minute. You see, when we were doing this, when you discover that when you have terms in relations, shepherd is to sheep, as a ruler is to his subjects, the relationships that exist here, right? He leads his sheep, right? He leads them to pasture, he protects, he cares, right, etc. Right? Well, liquor. So too the relationship between a ruler and his subjects. He leads his subjects, he protects his subjects, he cares for his people, but not in exactly the same way, but in a similar way. Because if he protected his subjects, the way in which a shepherd does his sheep, he'd have to go and get a couple of more police dogs, wouldn't he? Right? So it's similar. The whole game then is to find similar relationships between the two sets. When you do that here, when you do that here and find similar relationships between the two sets, you're understanding yourself analogically. That's the difference. You're finding and discovering analogical relationships between your present and your past so that you are then free with a different kind of future. That's the Greek way. This is the classical way of exploring the problem. There's a lot behind it. I enjoy going through it, and uh, I'll pause. That's part of what you're talking about, uh, the current uh, A and B in somebody's psychology, and exploring the uh, C of D in the past. I think they call that, from what I've heard before, they call that sort of cognitive regression, mm -hmm. and that's what it's called in psychotherapy, I think. At least that's how I experienced it. This is the first time I've ever heard it called as, called it philosophical. So I guess the question to me is, 
Is there any uh, golden mean anger or any golden mean shame? Or <laughs> well, there are two things, all right? Well, that's a very good point. Look here, two points. One is philosophical approach to understanding relationships is different from all kinds of psychotherapy for one fundamental reason. We want to know why the person came to believe the conclusions they reached. They themselves reached. That's the key. Why is that the key? Because this is clearly in the realm of belief. And in the only reason we have a problem is because we're playing sophists against ourselves. As someone has been a sophist to us. In the past, someone convinced us of something. Right? They convinced us some about something. They looked believable. We walked away believing it. This is a classic problem of the problem of sophistry and, and the formation of opinions. Quite correct. And that is not psychotherapy. That's philosophy. <clears throat> and therefore, philosophy does nothing other than, in one realm, I should say, to explore how do we ever come to the conclusions we come to through these persuasive devices because the whole game, the golden section, the only thing we ever do is to try to bring the person to understand just one thing, to try to come to realize how they themselves came to their own conclusions which bind them. We are responsible for our own ignorance, not society or families. Yeah. All consistently present. As a matter of fact, you can see it's all consistently present in another way. Uh, when you take the series, Fibonacci series, you can take each successive set and relate it to its predecessor. All right, let's take this set and relate it to its predecessor. Eight is to five, as five is to three. You have a mean proportion, a golden section. There you go, mean proportion. And as this extends itself, the Fibonacci series and this uh, uh, what we call the golden section, coincide. This is also a transmission. This is the transmission uh, paradigm. Teacher, student, student becomes the teacher, who in turn deals with students. This is the basic paradigm for the transmission in any teaching situation. So, so the question is, you know, Socrates has passed. Pardon? Socrates? Has passed. He did have a student. Yes. So, really, God could have hiccuped, created the universe, and died, right? And the universe just kept on going. That is one of the problems with having uh, an absent landlord. So, you hiccup the principle in, into effect. Yeah. And yeah. Sort of like That's a problem. That's a problem with an absent landlord. Yeah, your landlord can quit. The question then becomes, you see, what, what makes sense in terms of uh, the relationship between God and the creation. Uh, and this becomes, the reason this becomes quite interesting is because it is not immediately obvious that there has to be the idea of goodness between the two. This is the overlap between the two, right? Pardon? The overlap. The overlap you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this only becomes obvious if you take it out of theology and put it into metaphysics. God is one. 
Now, if you can show that the, the idea of a pure one is equivalent to the idea of the good, as there is in Plato and, and the Neoplatonic tradition, then you can show that um, um, every, every good unifies what participates or partakes of it. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Of course. Of course. All metaphysics is ifs. It's all analogy. Of course. Absolutely right. Okay. But, but there's a consequence of the is or the was. Oh yes. If there's an is, then you do have goodness, and you have that. You get that connection. Yes. If there was a was. Yes. Forget the connection. That's right. You can't create it. <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's the problem with theology. Theology doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily and doesn't make the connection obvious between God, creation, and goodness. But in metaphysics, it, 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 it follows, and this becomes the classical 13 proposition in Proclus. Well, I think theology just says you have to believe it. Well, uh, it's a question of, is that, see, that's quite right, you have to believe it. There's a difference between having an opinion with and without understanding. And the significance of the mean analogy, remember when we were doing it before, when you have those terms that are the same, there's something fundamentally similar between understanding and having the right opinion. And that is, neither have knowledge. And in that regard, you have to move from having a right opinion based upon some kind of understanding to confirm it in your own experience. Oh yeah, that's true. Has to. Just has to have the circle K. Has to go over there. That's right. That's right. Otherwise, it's a theoretical structure that has no way of verifying its principles. So if somebody has one over there. Yeah. That, that proves. They can, for them, they can, they can say they have a basis for proving it, but it's not transferable. That is, everyone has to do their own eating and drinking and their own seeing and their own enlightenment. Yeah, that's quite true. Well, you know, as I, I, I like saying, uh, I'm sure other people have said it as well, if you have nothing else to do, you might as well get enlightened, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, while you're here, it's a worthwhile goal, you know, if you have nothing else to do. <laughs> between reason and the intelligible. Reason in English is just the logical processes that help us come to conclusions. That's different than the noetic realm, which is the realm of the intelligence. We, this, this, see, all, all mystical and all philosophical systems, East and West, differ on this just one point. They may all have a highest term and they have the need to reach it. The Neoplatonic tradition is the only one that has a key and absolutely absolute need for understanding. That's the only one. Because they moved through here to here, back here, back to here. That is to say, um, it is not enough it is not sufficient to, to reach levels of enlightenment. You have to be able to also understand yourself, 
and be able to understand what to do with understanding because that that polishes the diamond. Personally, I got stuck in the cognitive regression, you know, significant events, and it seemed like it was digging up the shit forever. You know what I mean? That's right. That's what it would do. So I've sort of popped out, but you're sort of claiming that it's polishing the diamond, then, right? Well, not only that, we, you have to focus. See, it is not, there's an endless process of del, you know, bringing up the past, bringing up the past. There are two things wrong with that. One is it's not the past. It's our beliefs about the past. All right. Second, all right, the past is only significant as a way of identifying what's going on in your present so that you can see a relationship between the two and discover why that, it, that persists in your present. This is my, this is my, my, my screen, my, my blinders or something. Yeah. Like that. Okay. yeah, and that has to be discovered that there was something in the past that you concluded about, you believed about yourself. Yes, others may have created the condition, but you came to the belief. And that's spring. Would you say that the, the cognitive and the dream approach is more powerful than just the cognitive? Or you well, uh, what's, yeah, I would go further. I'd say the, the um, what we want, what we want is one system, one way of approaching things that will include a passing thought, a passing thought, why it's there, a recurring thought that might bother us and Lee comes and goes, or memory, or memory, right. so fantasy, right? Why we indulge in fantasies and why they take the form they do. Right. Then we want to know how that differs from spontaneous fantasies rather than those that we might engage in directly. How that deals with dreams. Now that deals with our experiences in our meditations, especially when they become more, more profound. Philosophical midwifery says there's one, the whole thing. There's no special tool for this. One way through the whole thing. That's the way to be. And it's open to all men, and it's, uh, it should be our birthright. And then we can engage ourselves in a more integral and more um, profoundly um, integrative way. Question here. Is, um, if somebody's kicking the shit out of you, where, that, where does that fall in that, that pathway? I mean, you're going to the past. Do you, do you put that in fantasies? Well, people get to, to, you know, go through a variety of things. It's not what they go through. It's the conclusions they draw from those. Oh, so you're saying that every, every experience would have some sort of corollary it is the conclusions we draw from experiences that bind us, not the experience. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. That's the problem with the torturer, isn't it? A torturer knows that he, can't invo he cannot bring about greater pain than a dentist. That is to say, there's a ceiling to pain. You pass out, reach a certain point, you pass out. What he wants to do is to take the pain and transfer it into suffering. And if he can get you to believe that you're suffering under his pain, then you're caught. It's the conclusions you draw from your experience. That's binding. And that's what we want to be free. We want to see whether or not the conclusions are in all respects fair to ourselves and to our reality. Otherwise, life couldn't go on. I mean, how many people have gone through wars and all kinds of uh, terrible things from child abuse and a variety of kinds to starvations and riots, etc., etc. It's the conclusions, not not necessarily the experience. That I hope that's helpful. Or so. Uh, just a purple question. <laughs> Come on, more. <laughs> Is there any sort of experience for your No, no, do it again. In, the, in, in your general overall background experience of applying this, are there any experiences that are not cognitive? 
with it that, are, that could be running it. Which means you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to access them. I, I don't, I'm not sure. Are you saying, are there any irrational episodes in man that cannot be retraced to? I imagine there may be some physiological problems, neurological, that someone might have. So, so, I've heard that, but that's not my realm. Right, some neurological damage or something like that. Um, that would interest me to see whether or not there are pure cases of that. So. Okay. Thank you. What? Just one quick thing. In this kind of process, when one is working back through the cognitive process, is there a point where we're saying, well, when you were two and a half or three years old, you could have said no? But Every time. But isn't there a point where you sort of couldn't, or your world ended, or you would? No, oh, that someone may kill you for taking a stand. That's true. Right. Yeah, that's right. So that's that doesn't. But at that moment, you're free. And that's a realization that's always going to be true. That's always true. In truth. Yeah, in truth. In the realm of truth, beauty, yeah. goodness. Yeah. That someone. I mean, I can die now for what I believe. The point is, am I going to pretend or believe what I believe? Everyone, if there's a belief, there's also the possibility of rejecting it. You can always turn to someone in some situation, and if you're not eloquent, you can, you can uh, make several gestures which are significantly profane that they'll understand you're rejecting them. Right. Put your fingers to your nose or a wide variety of clear messages that you reject it. Of course, they may kill you the next moment, but that's at least you go to the next world with a little bit of truth on your soul. That's your choice. No one says you're going to have a long life if you're honest. That's your choice, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and how that may help you in the next world is still being debated. But for that moment, you're free. You're free in that you are absolutely in, in your to yourself. And if other people can't take it, that's their problem, not yours. So is there a discourse on on truth versus death? Yeah, that must be quite Yes, it finally comes down to the value of truth. That's right. Because no matter what kind of a problem a person has, sooner or later, their decision is going to be to say what's true. And, I, you know, and they're not free until they do. And the life that isn't lived in truth is not really living. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. The unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought of something. In the therapeutic process, you know, A is to B is B is to C. You know, once it's dug out, you know, looking at it, sometimes it's just stuck. You know, you can't get any further. But I think now if you just go, is the A and uh, those permutations, that might be enough to... That's right. To, to kick That's right. That's right. I, I'd go further, you see. I would say that um, we have a medical model, and I reject the medical model. Right. That is to say, someone is professionally skilled, and they're the only pe people who should do it. I would rather say that if someone has a difficulty, they should be able to go to any number of people who are familiar with the method and try it out. And if they can't get anywhere with one person, it's likely to be the problem with the person they're talking to who can't find their way through it. That is to say, change, talk to someone else. When people come to me, I say, look here, how many people you talk to before me? Come on, go out and talk to them. Try it. See how far you can go. Come to me as a last resort. <laughs> right. And then, if you do gain an insight, go back to the other people and say, hey, this is what you missed. Help them out. We should be part of a growing learning community, and then man can become rational and have interesting ways of relating to one another. So that's what I do. I say, hey, how many people are familiar with this method? Okay, everyone try it. Everyone can be it. Everybody can do it. Someone's stuck? Go, for, go to the next person. I think the difficulty is staying with one person who they may be themselves stuck on your problem. Say, okay, thank you. You're stuck. Go to someone else. Yeah, seriously, definitely. 
Then just tell them, though, by the way, if you do get an answer, come back and tell me what I didn't see, and then everybody grows. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you.